Much of my childhood, I spent living in books. I loved books for all kinds of reasons. They expanded my world and allowed me a passage out of my own life, escape, I guess one might say, and into a story. As the poet Emily Dickinson wrote, there is no frigate. Frigate? Is that how you say it? Frigate? Frigate? Frigate, like a book to take us lands away. I'm that person that when a novel ended, I really missed the characters. I would go around grieving for a few days. I remember when someone, when I, I once ran into a friend and, I, and they had just moved, and I made a kind of Freudian slip. I asked them, I meant to ask them what street they lived on, and I asked them what page they lived on. So you can see I really live in books. No wonder I became a rabbi. It allows me to live life in a sacred book, to live as part of the people of the book as actively as possible. Not just escape, I, I go to television for that, but studying the Torah, and even more than that, living with it, enlarges my life considerably. It's a gift I am ever grateful for. Right now, we're in a period where we're very aware that the high holidays are coming, right? They, they feel like they're coming fast and furious and right after Labor Day weekend. And it's a period of tshuva, of, of repentance. But the tradition doesn't say to us, okay, you arrive at Rosh Hashanah and then just make tshuva, right? The tradition gives us a long, expansive run-up. And they do that through story. The, t the tradition kind of, our rabbis overlay um, the narrative arc of the Torah onto this period. See, here's how it works. We go from Shavuot, right, which was, I guess, I don't know, last May, the seventh of Sivan, when Moses receives the tablets, right, the first tablets. The next month is Tammuz, and on the 17th of Tammuz, which is also the beginning of a three-week mourning period leading up to Tisha B'Av, right? A day where we mourn the destruction of the temple and all kinds of Jewish calamities, endless Jewish calamities. Um, the rabbis declare that this is the day that Moshe came down the mountain with the two tablets of law and saw the Israelites dancing around a golden calf and shattered those tablets. So if we stay right at that moment for, a moment, for, for just a minute before we um, go on with the rest of this narrative arc, we go to our Parsha where Moses tells us about the story of the golden calf. Listen to his dramatic recounting of the incident. I started down the mountain, a mountain ablaze with fire, the two tablets of covenant in my hand. I saw how you had sinned against the Lord, your God. You had made yourselves a molten calf. You had been quick to stray from the path that the Lord had enjoined upon you. There, thereupon, I gripped the two tablets and flung them away with both my hands, smashing them before your eyes. Now, the Hebrew word for, for smashing them is really interesting. It's the ashabrim, right? So it means to break, but it's the PL form, um, which in Hebrew is the intensive form of the verb. And instead of just to break, it means that he really shattered them. The pieces we can imagine scattered every, every which way. Those divine fragments of Torah desecrated. So to go back to our narrative arc, 17th of Tammuz, tablets are shattered. On the first of Elul, which is coming up, I think uh, maybe August 9th. I don't remember exactly what the secular date is. Um, Moshe is said to go back up the mountain for 40 days to receive the second tablets. And when do we receive those second tablets? On Yom Kippur, right? So the shattered tablets, and then God is furious at God's people and wants to destroy them and start all over again with Moses. And then Moses and God sort of reach some kind of rapprochement, and Moses goes back up the mountain, and then 40 days later, there we are at Yom Kippur, receiving the second set of tablets that signify forgiveness, and signify a second chance, and signify wholeness after destruction. So 
So this is true not only collectively, right, for us as a people, this, this shattering and this wholeness, but each one of us. And in fact, in Jewish tradition, when we think about the heart, right, the heart is often described as a, as a broken heart. So in um, Psalms, I think it's 51. Sorry, I can't find that specific verse. It says, Karov Adonai l'nishpare lev, ve'etz dakhe ruach yoshia. God is close to the brokenhearted. Those crushed in spirit, God delivers. Right? So there's something about brokenheartedness that allows God to become close. And we can imagine, if we think about it, what it is. Right? When we're all zipped up and we have it all together, right? who can really come close to that? It's in sort of acknowledging our human vulnerability, acknowledging that we have you know, some brokenness that we can get close to one another. And I guess that those are the moments when God feels that God can step in close. So let's think about the arc of this narrative for a few minutes relationally. The story almost ends. God is furious, right? No forgiveness in sight. God wants to destroy the people, start with Moses all over again, just the way God did with Noah and the flood. But Moses convinced God somehow to continue the story. The second tablets are much different than the first tablets. The first tablets are written on this side and that side with God's hand, right? God's handwriting. And the stone is hewed by God. The second tablets, Moses used the stone and then God writes on the stone. So it's born of partnership. And partnership is really such a beautiful sign of forgiveness because it's a sign of aligning ourselves to who the other is, right? The reality of who the other is. But the Israelites couldn't live with tablets that were just that divine. We needed something that was born of this divine human partnership. When Moses goes up to the mountain the second time and Moses and, Moses and God have an encounter, Moses is right in the cleft of the rock. And what happens between them is very interesting. It's usually translated as God declaring God's self to Moses. But in this mystical union or this mystical encounter, we don't actually know where the words are emerging from. So the words that come up between Moses and God may be familiar to you. The Lord, the Lord, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And yet God does not remit all punishment, but visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the fourth, the third and fourth generation. And in Hebrew, it goes like this, right? Adonai, Adonai, Erachum Echanu, Erach Apayim, Erach Hesed Emet, No Techesed Lahavathir, No Se Avod Afesha, Vechata Benakeh. So those are the words that we hear through the whole high ho holiday period, right? Through Elul, through Rosh Hashanah, through Yom Kippur. Those are the words that signify really forgiveness. But why these words? So first of all, it describes God as merciful. So that's good, right? But second of all, so God has this strange pattern of wanting to destroy the Israelites, right? Again and again, it comes up. And Moses has to, you know, talk him out of it or talk him. Talk her out of it. Right? God is sometimes a very angry God and destructive. But here, right here, we have a vision of the generations extending kindness to the thousand, thousandth generation. Right? And, and even visiting the sin of the parents upon children, children's children, that means that God's not going to wipe us out in one fell swoop because of our sins. Right? Instead, they travel through the generations, which is could be the subject of another um, theology course. But it's, it's a vision of continuity. It's a vision of the story continuing. So now I want to say a couple of things about the shattered and the whole tablets. Tradition has it 
uh, I think it's the Tanhuma, that the tablets, the whole tablets and the shattered tablets travel side by side in the ark, right? They're both sacred and both crucial to the existence of the Israelites. So why do we save these broken fragments? I think they are testimony to who we are as a people and as individuals, right? And it's interesting because we often talk about repair and fixing things, but the shattered tablets never get fixed, right? We get a second set of tablets and then the broken tablets and the whole tablets travel side by side. This to me was really illuminating, especially this year around, because I think I've spent much of my adult life, and I know many of you probably have too, just dreaming of fixing things, right? Fixing yourself, fixing your childhood hurts, fixing disappointment in love, fixing one's profession, just fixing, fixing, fixing. And I finally realized that no, one just lives with the brokenness and one lives with the wholeness. And perhaps living with the brokenness one achieves a different kind of wholeness, but not through repair. So I finally declare, I'm done with repair. We're about to move into the month of love, right? Elul, which stands for Ani Dodi Vidodi Li. I am for my beloved and my beloved. I am, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. And I think that's the time to gather up all the fragments, all the brokenness, and allow them to be unified in love. And it's interesting because remember how Moses utterly shattered the tablets? Like every time it describes in the Torah that, that he shattered them, that intensive verb is used. So who collected them? How did they get to be in one place? How did they get unified? You know, I know of no midrash that explains that. And I began to imagine, because the, the rabbis tell us that the women were not part of the sin of the golden calf, that when they saw Moses in that fit of rage and shattering the tablets, that they went along gathering each fragment lovingly and depositing, depositing them into one place. Right? And perhaps that's the work we need to do this at Lul, taking each one of our own broken fragments and bringing them to one place. This is the time to lovingly collect the shattered pieces of our lives. This is the time to declare them sacred. This is the time to enter the month of Elul and allow ourselves to become one through love, to rise above being scattered right, scattered and shattered to, to unity. This is the healing that comes from living in a greater story, living in a sacred story. The rabbis knew what they were doing when they imprinted this narrative arc on this period. It gives us a way to not only think theologically about the story, but really enter it wholeheartedly. The sacred story, the Torah, mirrors all that we are and all that we can be. So we can hold it, all of it, the destruction and the wholeness, the love and the rage, the kindness and the cruelty, the forgiveness, the compassion, the resentment, the life and the death, the forgiveness that makes life livable, the wholeness that is born of living in a greater and collective story.